Sarah, uh, who is a postdoc at Cornell, uh, who will be talking to us about um, the age of geologic rocks. Um, Jake just finished his PhD in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Rutgers University. Um, and now he's going to tell you a little bit what he's working on now. So take it away, Jake. All right. Uh, thanks, Lauren. And thanks for everyone for, for joining along. Um, I think it's great that the museum can hold these events um, remotely. Um, the lectures so far have been great, and hopefully I can... ...start a little bit about myself. Um, I couldn't think of a, of a fun fact, so what you get is that I love sports, love watching sports, um, and I haven't realized how much I love them until recently when I can't watch them. So there's only so many Boston sports reruns you can watch, but I'm, I'm making, making my way through this. Um, like Lauren mentioned, I earned my PhD from Rutgers University, um, and I'm now a postdoc at Cornell University, which is in Ithaca, New York. And my favorite rock type is a pseudo tacolite. I know that's tough to say, but it's a beautiful rock. In fact, I'm standing in front of one of those here in this picture. Um, this is in South Africa, and this rock forms from meteorite impacts. So if you notice in this picture, all of this black veined stuff, if you follow along with the blue pointer, um, that's surrounding these bigger class of rock. And this black stuff, it forms from the heat um, that's provided to the surface of the earth and a meteorite impact. So it gets really hot and it completely melts, melts this rock. So it's a beautiful rock and I'm glad that I, was, I had the chance to go, uh, go visit that one. Um, so to get into also what I do for research, um, you know, I work with a lot of different scientists on a lot of different things, um, ranging from anthropology, to lunar rocks. Um, but my primary, my primary research focus is based kind of out of this cartoon here. And this is just your standard cartoon of an eruptive volcano where you have lava flowing in, onto the surface. And then below ground, there's a magma chamber where the liquid magma stays and can also start to uh, crystallize into rocks. Um, so my work at Cornell deals with stuff that's up here at the top. Um, namely, uh, when you have eruptions, you can get minerals like this. This is a picture of an olivine. And within this olivine, there's these little bubbles. Okay, and these bubbles are called melt inclusions. And these bubbles sort of give us a window into past eruptions so we can see things like carbon dioxide and water content. And we can start to figure out um, how lavas throughout our eruptions throughout Earth's history can affect uh, the climate. Now, what I worked on as a PhD, and I still work on today, is the stuff that goes on here at the bottom, so in this magma chamber. When these rocks crystallize below the surface, they form things that look like this. So this is a layered intrusion. And layered intrusions are important um, because they provide us with most of our economically important um, platinum ore deposits. So if you have anything that has platinum in it, whether it's uh, in your car, in your jewelry, in your electronics, it probably came from a layered intrusion. Now, I mentioned that I work on um, a lot of different things, uh, but within all my projects, or most of my projects, there's one underlying theme, and that is geochronology. What geochronology is, is figuring out the age of a rock or a material. So it's taking that rock that we're studying and putting it into the context of time. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and first, I just want to talk about what's the importance of geochronology. Um, now, these are just a list of a few items that I thought of off the top of my head. If you asked another geologist, they would probably give you an infinitely long different list. Um, so just some things. One is context. It gives us big picture context. So things like what's the age of the Earth? What is the age of the moon? Um, how old are the meteorites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it can answer big picture questions um, like that. It can also relate geological phenomena around the globe. So you can imagine if we have a magmatic event that produces a rock one place in the globe. Um, if we can find a similar rock that is the same age somewhere else in the globe, they may be related. Um, and this is actually the case with a lot of rocks that are involved in mass extinction events in Earth's history. We can find rocks of the same age based on this geochronology. Uh, they're also important for economic reasons. So I mentioned layered intrusions hold a lot of ore deposits. Um, well, my research and geochronology of these layered intrusions um, helps us understand how these ores form and how fast they form. And then sort of switching gears, 
um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later too, um, geochron geochronology can have a big importance on archaeology um, and human history. So things like um, human history, the rise of the ages, or even human evolution. So that's just why it's important. Um, and I just want to note that I'm going to build off of a lot of the the other lectures that have been going on in this series. Um, and one of those was a lecture by Dr. Lauren Adamo, where she talked about relative versus absolute dating. Okay, and what was the difference between those? Well, relative dating means you don't get a numerical age. You just figure out what is older and what is younger. So this picture is from a field course that I taught um, where the students are looking at this outcrop. And with relative dating, all we would know is that up top here is younger um, than it is down here. So the older rocks are at the bottom and the younger rocks are at the top. But we wouldn't have an age, a numerical age to go along with that. Now absolute dating would assign those uh, stratas a actual numerical age. So how a geologist might go about figuring this out is they might go out into the field and these horizontal lines that go across the screen, um, these are actually ash deposits. So a geologist might go sample this ash deposit and then do some of the radioactive dating techniques we're going to talk about to get an actual number age. Now, another analogy for this, to put it kind of in perspective, might be the age relationship between a grandparent and a grandchild. So in the relative dating sense, all we would know is that the grandparent is older than the grandchild. That's all we would know. But with absolute dating, we would start to know more specifics. We would know that the grandparent is 70 years old and the grandchild is 15 years old. So we start to get more information with actual numerical ages. Um, so we're going to talk about just absolute dating um, for the rest of this presentation. Now, to get into how we calculate an age, we have to go back to chemistry. Um, and like I said, we're going to build off previous presentations. Um, and one of the previous ones was uh, by Alyssa Madeira, and she talked about the chemistry of rocks. So you'll remember that this is the periodic table of elements. And I'll note that there's certain elements in this table that are more useful than others in deciphering the age of a rock. Um, but let's remember what actually makes up an element, and that is the atom. So an element is made up of an atom, and within this atom, there's a nucleus. So in the center, there's the nucleus, and this is made up of protons and neutrons. And then around the outskirts of the nucleus, there are electrons that orbit the nucleus, sort of like uh, the planets orbit the sun in our solar system. So this is um, an atom of oxygen. Here's the nucleus in the center, and here are the orbiting electrons. Now, like I said, this is sort of a review of the geochemistry lecture that you guys had a few weeks ago. But for our purposes, we want to take this one step further. So we want to go from what an atom is to what an isotope is. Uh, so an isotope is a variety of an element. Um, now, a very bad analogy for this, which will give you some insight into my eating habits lately, is that you can think of pizza as an element, and then different toppings represent different varieties of pizza. So for instance, a plain pizza might be one isotope of pizza. A pepperoni pizza might be another isotope of pizza. And maybe a pepperoni and veggie pizza would be a third type. Um, so putting that into actual chemistry terms, these are the three isotopes of the element hydrogen. Okay, and you'll notice right away that they all have the same number of protons. They all have one proton. They also all have the same number of electrons. They all have one electron orbiting the uh, nucleus. The only difference that makes these isotopes um, different is that they have a different number of neutrons in the nucleus. So that's all an isotope is. It's a single element um, with different amounts of neutrons within the nucleus. Um, I should also note that when you have more neutrons, your isotope is heavier. So hydrogen with this superscript three is the heaviest hydrogen isotope because it has two neutrons. Um, and the lightest one is the one with the superscript one, and that's because it has no neutrons um, in the nucleus. And what's lighter and heavier in terms of an isotope um, helps us actually be able to measure them in our instruments, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So now that we've talked about what an isotope actually is, time to go back to the periodic table for a second. 
Now it's important to note that yeah, yes, all of these elements have different isotopes, or at least most of them do. But some of those isotopes are radioactive, and that means they're unstable in the natural environment. So over time, they break down into a more stable form. And this radioactive decay into a more stable form is what allows us to calculate um, an age from measuring them. Now, uh, four elements on this table that we're going to focus on during this talk, or at least mention, um, they all have radioactive isotopes that we can use for age dating purposes. Um, those are carbon, and you'll see them with the red circles coming up, potassium, strontium, and uranium. Okay, what is radioactive decay? Um, well, like I mentioned, some isotopes are unstable. These are considered radioactive. So these elements, or rather their unstable isotopes, are going to decay or break down from their unstable isotope um, to a stable isotope. So we call the original unstable isotope the parent, and they end up breaking down to a new stable isotope, which we'll call the daughter. Now, an example of this, or one of the more common examples of this, um, is carbon-14. So the isotope 14 carbon, uh, half of any amount of carbon-14 is going to decay to a more stable version of nitrogen-14 over a period of 5,730 years. So you might have noticed that I said only half of this amount decays. And that's because we call this the half-life of a radioactive isotope. And scientists know the half-lives of radioactive isotopes. So if we pick up a rock and can measure both the parent and daughter isotopes, um, since we know the half-life of that system, we can lead, that can lead us to the age of a rock. Now, before we get into actually calculating an age, uh, I just want to do a quick animation about radioactive decay um, in terms of half-lives, because I think this will give us a good visualization um, of how this works over time. So you see this big uh, rectangle full of yellow atoms or circles that we'll consider atoms. Pretend that this is our rock when it first formed. Now all the yellow atoms are radioactive. They're the parent isotope. Um, eventually they'll change into a more stable atom, which will be represented by black. But right now they're all yellow because the rock just formed. Now the graph on the right here as we go through is gonna show you on the Y axis, the one that goes up and down here, how many yellow atoms are left in the rock. And the X axis going left to right is time, but in terms of half-life. So as your half-life goes up, time is getting longer. So if we move forward one half-life, half of the yellow parent atoms should change to daughter atoms, the stable version. So if we move forward one, there we go, our rock now has 50% of the radioactive parent isotope and 50% of the stable isotope. So there's 500 yellow and 500 black, and you can follow along the graph here. Now, if we Jake, move- Jake, it forward, hasn't updated on the screen yet. Oh, uh, okay. You can let me know when it does. <laughs> it's being <before>. slow. <laughs> it's, still, it's still on the 100% time one. There we go, now it's on time yeah. two. All right, um, maybe for this part, you can just tell me when it switches. I'll tell you when I click. Um, and now it's back to 100%. Yeah, I, that was my bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the joys of a uh, windy day in Ithaca in the internet. Um, did it go back to the, yep. the half-life? We're at time, okay. time two, yep. So we're at time two, which is one half-life. Um, and half of these dots have turned black. So they change from an unstable yellow atom to a stable black atom. Now, if we move forward to a second half-life, half of those remaining yellow unstable atoms should also become stable. So I just clicked and eventually that will change. Go ahead, it's there. Okay, so now we've, we've moved forward another half-life, so now we're at two half-lifes. And you notice that what was 500 um, remaining radioactive isotope atoms has de decreased in half again to 250. Um, and the stable atoms has increased to 750. And this is at two, two half-lifes. And again, we're moving down this, this curve with time. 
Now I'm going to move forward um, a little bit quicker this time. We're going to go to three, four, and then five half-lives. And what I want you to watch is just how the color changes inside the rock and also how we decrease um, along this curve until we almost have no uh, radioactive isotopes left over. So I'll go ahead and click slowly until five, and then uh, Lauren can let me know when we get to the fifth half leg. Still on the second, there it goes. There's it's on the third now and fourth. It's on the fifth now. Okay, so now we're on the fifth half-life. After five half-lifes, there's only 31 remaining uh, radioactive isotope atoms, and there's now 969 um, stable isotope atoms. Now you can imagine if we picked up this rock at half-life five, and we were able to measure both the amount of remaining parent isotope atoms and the amount of stable isotope atoms, and we knew the half-life of that system, we would be able to back calculate the age that that rock formed. The other thing I want you to notice is that over lots, over a lot of half-lives, say half-life 10, we almost have no remaining parent isotope. So for certain uh, geochronologic systems, if you go too many half-lifes, there's not enough left of the parent to even measure. And this is why something like carbon-14 um, can't be used over a certain period of time. Uh, so next, I want to look at just some of the, the more commonly used geochronometers, so some of the most commonly used radioactive systems uh, for dating. Um, Lauren, did you go to the next slide with a table? Yes, it's there. Okay. Maybe it'll speed up here. Um, but these are just uh, some of the common, commonly used uh, radioactive systems for dating rocks and minerals. Um, two that I'm very familiar with are these top two, um, and they're used for dating very old things. So this first one is uranium and lead, where uranium, an isotope of uranium is radioactive and it decays to a stable isotope of lead. Now this is useful for an age range of about 10 million years to things that are older than the earth. And we commonly date uh, minerals using this, this method, things like zircon or great. This is a zircon grain. So that's a single mineral from the rock. Um, there's also things like apatite. Uh, so these grains are apatite grains. These are also very useful um, with this method. Uh, the next method is potassium and argon. So uh, potassium, 40 potassium is radioactive and it decays to a stable version of 40 argon. Uh, this is useful from about 10,000 years old to again older than the age of the earth. And we do this on minerals that are high in potassium, so things like mica. Uh, here's a picture of mica. Um, mica is a sheet silicate. If you've been out on a hike and picked up rocks, you've probably found this mineral. It falls apart into, into nice parallel sheets. Um, so we use this, this mineral a lot. Um, another method is rubidium strontium, um, which again has the same sort of age range as uranium lead, um, but we can do full rocks in, uh, with this method. You don't necessarily need to date individual minerals if you don't want to. Um, and then again, like I mentioned, uh, for lower or more recent ages, um, and you're probably more familiar with this because it's the most commonly used age dating system, is carbon-14 dating. So Radioactive carbon-14 decays to stable nitrogen-14, and this is useful from ages about 100 years old to as far back as about 50,000 years old. So fairly young, at least in my mind, because I study old things, um, but this is super useful for biological materials. So uh, again, things that are related more in an anthropological um, sense. So we want to know how we actually get an age of a rock. Um, that's the point. So I want to take you through sort of the, the actual physical step-by-step -step process of how we can go 
from me standing in front of this giant outcrop on the side of the road um, to knowing the age of this rock is just over 2 billion years old. So how do we go from, from this to this? And step one is field work. And uh, the majority of my field work in the past uh, six years um, has taken place in South Africa. So my first step is finding a, a cheap plane ticket from JFK to Johannesburg, which is about a 15 and a half hour flight, um, to go find the rocks that I need to answer, answer my questions. So when we get there, we, we have questions that we want to answer. We do a lot of, of map work ahead of time so we know where we're going. And we want to find the right outcrop that answers the question that we're trying to solve. So we stopped here at this outcrop. Um, and I'm not sure if we dated this exact one, but you can imagine that we wanted to know the age of the rock formation here. So the next step is to take a, represent, a representative sample of that outcrop, so something about the size of this. Um, you might ask, well, why don't we take more of this sample? Um, well, when we do these trips, we likely will take around 100 to 200 samples home. Um, so you can imagine if we take more than this, it gets a little expensive um, and difficult to get them all back to the United States. And we don't take less than this, because if we're looking for zircon in this rock, um, you know, the mineral that we want to, to get an age for, there might only be 10 zircon grains in this entire rock. So we need to take as much as we can, but be cognizant of the difficulties that, that, that arise in getting it back. Um, that outcrop is on the side of the road, but we can also get rocks from other places. Um, we can get them from mines, especially in South Africa. This is an above ground mine. Um, where we can take samples from. For reference, uh, where my blue pointer is sitting right now is a dump truck. Um, so this is a, this is a huge mine. Um, there's also mines that are below ground. Um, so this was from 2014 in South Africa in a platinum mine um, where we were lucky enough to get to go down and, and check out some of the geology. So you can get samples from a lot of, a lot of different uh, places. And then sometimes you get lost and this is just kind of a a fun picture that was taken of a colleague, Alex, and myself um, in South Africa, where we're sort of looking out into the bush, um, trying to find outcrops and, and having a difficult time. Um, but anyway, no matter what happens, you come back with the rocks that you need um, to try to figure out the ages to help you answer the questions that you have. So once we have our rock, we need to get our zircon. So how do we get our zircon minerals out of this out of this rock. And the next step is lab work. And to put it bluntly, it's making big rocks into small rocks. So it goes, the rock that we just took goes through a number of steps where we, we keep making the rock smaller and smaller. We crush it, we mill it, and it gets sieved until it's about sand size. Um, so we go from that boulder to something that's sand sized. And within this sand are the zircons that we want to, we want to find and date. So the next step is separating the zircon from that, from that sand. Um, and one of the first ways to do that is to first take everything that's uh, magnetic out of the sample. Zircon is not magnetic. So we take a powerful hand magnet um, and we'll take out everything that is magnetic from that sand. So we're getting closer to finding the zircon. The next step is using density. So zircon has a very specific density. Um, and because of that specific density, we can make a specialized liquid that's in here. Okay, this orange is liquid, which will separate zircon from the rest of the minerals um, that, that we have remaining. So we dump in our sample, uh, we mix it up. So this is this middle picture is, is the sample all mixed up. And because zircon is heavier than the rest of the uh, minerals in here, it'll settle to the bottom while everything else floats to the top. And this is how we separate zircon. So from that one rock we collected, and with all of that work, we might be lucky to separate about 10 zircons, nine or 10 zircons. Now these aren't from that actual rock. These are uh, courtesy of, of Aiden Taylor, who gave a lecture the other day. But this shows you sort of the typical uh, yield of zircon from the rocks that we, that we study. And some of them will not look nice, like number seven. Some of them won't look as good, like number five. So, you know, we, 
we have to be very careful with what we're doing and it takes a lot of work to go from from getting a rock from the outcrop to actually getting a zircon um, from which we can get an age. Here's another another nicer picture of, of one of the zircons. Now the next and almost final step is chemistry. So at this point we destroy the mineral with the mass spectrometer uh, in a basic sense. So like I mentioned before, if we want to confirm the age of a mineral or a rock, we need to be able to measure both the parent and the, ice, the, the daughter isotopes within that sample. And to do that, we use a mass spectrometer. Now mass spectrometers all sort of have the same three basic components. There's the source, which is here at the front end. Then there's a magnet in the middle and a detector where we measure things. Okay, now the first part is ionization that takes place at the source. This is how we destroy the sample. This is often done in a plasma. So this is a, a, a plasma from one of the mass specs I ran at Rutgers University. Um, and this is, you know, this plasma is at a really high temperature comparable to, you know, the plasma on the sun. And this completely destroys the sample. It turns it into ions, okay? Now, once the sample is destroyed and turned into ions, it can be sent into the mass spectrometer where we separate the isotopes. So here at the source, all the isotopes go in one line. But as we get to the magnet, the magnet starts to pull isotopes apart from each other based on uh, mass. So I mentioned that some isotopes are heavier than others in, the, in a previous slide. The daughter isotope, the stable one, is the lighter one. So that will get pulled by the magnet towards the inside as it, weight, as it makes its way towards the, the detector. The parent isotope is usually heavier, and that will stay closer to the outside of the magnet. It won't get pulled as much. Um, so what happens is the ions get into the source, and they make it into the magnet, where the isotopes are separated so that when they make it to the detector, we can measure uh, the, the daughter isotope here and the parent isotope up here. Um, we can measure them pretty easily if the magnet is, is bigger. Um, and that's, that's what we measured. So here's just two mass specs at Rutgers University. Um, here's the one I ran. It's this little box here. Here's a laser that we use to shoot things. Um, and here's a bigger one, um, which has a bigger magnet, a bigger magnet. So a bigger magnet spreads the isotope, uh, the isotopes farther apart, but it's a little bit more expensive. But either way, they, they basically do do the same, the same thing. Now, once we've measured uh, those two isotopes, we can do math, okay? And we won't go too much into the, into the details of the math, but in general, since we know D, which is the daughter isotope, and we know P, which is the parent isotope from our mass spectrometry, um, and we know the half-life, which is included in this term, we can then calculate T, which is the age of the, of the mineral, and eventually the age of the rock that we were looking at. Um, and if you don't know what this, what this animation's from, it's from Star Trek Enterprise, uh, which is a decent, a decent show. Uh, so we figured out our age. Um, now I just want to go quickly through um, a couple of examples. Um, this example I like talking about, this is the oldest zircon on Earth. Here's a picture of, of the zircon. And like I mentioned, we use the uranium lead system to, to figure out the age of zircons. Uh, this zircon is found in the Jack Hills Formation in Western Australia. And its uranium lead age is up to 4.4 billion years old. So the age of the Earth is 4.54 billion years old, and this uranium lead age is, is approaching that. And so it's, it's one of the oldest um, things of Earth that we can date um, on this planet, or it is the oldest thing of Earth that we can date on this planet. Um, so that's one of my favorites. Um, another is some of the work I did as a, as a PhD student, and that's the age of some of South Africa's mineral resources. Um, so I didn't use the uranium lead system for this. I used uh, the next system, which is 40 potassium to 30 uh, to 40 argon. And I did this on micas. So remember those sheet silicates? Here's a picture of one under under an electron microprobe. Um, and within this magma chamber in South Africa, I found that almost all of uh, South Africa's mineral wealth formed extremely rapidly or almost instantaneously about 2 billion years ago. And just to put that into more perspective, that's about 
$3.3 trillion in known resources and about another $3.4 trillion in undiscovered resources. And here's just another picture from an underground mine showing one of these, one of these ore deposits here up top in black. So again, another example of how geochronology can be important um, economically to understand how some of these, these resources form. <clears throat> and then one final uh, example, back to the carbon-14 dating. Here's Otzi the Iceman, which you may have heard of. Uh, Otzi was discovered frozen in a, in a valley glacier um, in the Val Sinales, uh, which is in Italy, in 1991. He's almost entirely preserved, along with all of his belongings. as well as the things he was carrying, places him um, at 5,300 years old, which is even a little bit older than the Copper Age. Uh, so this is a, a world famous carbon-14 ages, um, and I encourage you to go to this website. There's a, there's a full website to go along with the museum um, that houses, houses the mummy. So carbon-14 is also a, a very uh, awesome dating technique, but it just works at younger ages than, than the things that I generally, generally work on. Um, and then finally, uh, I would share some, some photos, but we're out of time, so I'll just leave you with this one. Um, geochronology has brought me to a lot of places in the world, um, none better than South Africa, in my opinion. And when you have a little extra time and you get your field work done, you can go visit some places. And, and in 2014, I was lucky enough to, to snap a shot of, of this beautiful lion um, from the safety of a vehicle, nonetheless. But... Uh, you know, it's science. Science takes you wonderful places. Um, so with that, I will mention that there's an activity link from the Rutgers Geology Museum. Um, so please do this. It's, it's a wonderful activity. I've done it. Um, and with that, I will answer questions. Let me pull up the questions here. I'll stop sharing my screen. Stop sharing. All right, can everyone still see me? That's the first question. Hey, Lauren, can you just confirm that uh, you can still hear me? And Okay. All right, uh, so I'll start going through answering some of the questions that I have. I'll pull them up on my phone and then and try to answer them. So uh, Gwen from Cranberry, New Jersey wants to know why are diamonds so rare? Um, well, uh, I would first answer that diamonds are both rare and not rare, depending on how you look at it. Um, in the terms of just minerals on Earth, diamonds are rare, but in terms of gems, um, diamonds are just as, as common as any other gem or even more common. Um, they've sort of just cornered the market on, on being rare. Um, but in terms of, of Earth's geology, um, diamonds are rare because they only form in certain uh, magmatic systems or certain eruptions. And these are called kimberlite pipes or kimberlite eruptions. And because these happen so localized in, on, in Earth's history and in ge or geographically on Earth, um, it depends if it's mineable or not, which is what makes it rare. So I would end this question with saying diamonds are rare in terms of minerals as a whole, as they form geologically very specifically. Um, but in terms of, of gems, um, they're just as rare as, as other gems. Uh, the next question is, how old is the Earth and how do we know? Uh, that's a great question. So the Earth is actually about uh, 4.54 billion years old. Um, as I mentioned before, the oldest zircon we have on Earth is, uh, four, what did I say, 4.4 billion years old. And the oldest rocks we have on Earth are about 3.8 to 4 billion years old. So you'll notice that the rocks and minerals we have on Earth aren't as old as um, the Earth itself. So to measure the age of the Earth itself, we use meteorites and the moon. So the common age between meteorites and the moon, um, they all cluster around 4.4 uh, 4 billion years old and 4.6 billion years old. 
so knowing that the moon and the meteorites and everything in the solar system formed around this, formed at the same time, we can start to estimate that the age of the Earth is around 4.5 uh, billion years old. Now, using radioactive radioactive decay, um, folks have also modeled um, ore deposits, um, really old ones on Earth, and tried to figure out when those uh, ore deposits would have the same lead isotopic signature um, as meteorites and things like that. And that modeling age comes out to 4.54, which is exactly the same as we would expect from the ages of meteorites um, that we find throughout the solar system. Uh, let's see. Let's see, I got a question in the chat about the follow up on the diamonds. Where can you find diamonds? Um, there's kimberlite pipes really in lots of places in the world, but the ones I know the most are in Africa. Um, those are the ones that are heavily mined, especially in South Africa, but I believe there's also kimberlite pipes um, in Asia. Um, I'm not sure where else. I mean, there are diamonds in New Jersey, too. Uh, there's places where you can go go look for diamonds. Um, but they're not they're not the heavily mined uh, jewelry diamonds um, like you find elsewhere in the world. Um, another question would be, uh, Ria's mom would like to know, can rocks be radioactive and dangerous? What are some examples? Um, yes and no. So, so normal rocks that we date with radioact with radioactive systems, um, they are not dangerous. So, uh, the radioactivity in them or how they decay, because there's different types of decay, isn't one that's harmful harmful to us, or the half life is long enough that it's not. Harmful. Um, but for example, when we do uh, potassium to argon dating, we actually send our samples out um, to a nuclear reactor, and I won't get into the details, um, but they come back very radioactive. So I had a picture in my slideshow of a warning symbol um, for radioactivity, and that was in our lab at Rutgers University, because when our samples come back from the nuclear reactor, um, they're very, they're actually physically hot. Um, and that's because uh, they're, de they're decaying very quickly, and that is actually dangerous. We have to use some personal protection equipment to, to, to not get hurt from it. Um, and other things, I mean, if you find a, a pure ore or something that, that's radioactive, it might be dangerous, um, but in the most part, you, you won't, uh, you'll, you'll be okay. Um, let's see. Um, uh, trying to roll up the chat here. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, next question I have on the Google doc, um, is can fossils be used to date rocks? That's a great question, actually. Um, there's some rocks that are so young um, that they're sort of in the middle ground between, uh, or, or they're so young that we can't use the radioactive systems that I was talking about earlier. Um, so in that sense, if you find fossils within those rocks at different stratigraphic levels, remember we talked about relative dating where things on top are older than things, or younger than things on the bottom. Well, if we want to know the age of a rock, of a rock, and there's a fossil on top and a fossil on the bottom, we can use another dating method, maybe carbon-14, and date the fossil on the top and date the fossil on the bottom, and we would know that the age of the rock is between those two ages that we just calculated. So yes, we can we can calculate the age of a rock from the ages of um, of samples or of fossils. Okay. Um, Hazel from Boundbrook would like to know, is diamond a rock? Uh, no, Hazel, actually diamond is a mineral. So rocks are a collection of minerals. Um, so a rock gets named based on the minerals that are included in that rock. So for instance, everyone knows the, the term granite, okay? Um, if you went outside and picked up a granite, you would see lots of different colored crystals in the granite. All those crystals are minerals. There are things like plagioclase, feldspar, potassium, feldspar, quartz, maybe mica, maybe amphibole. Um, but those are minerals that all together make up a rock, which is granite. So diamond 
uh, just like zircon and apatite, uh, the other minerals I were talking about, those are minerals. Um, but they're a lot more rare than the, the feldspars and things that I was just talking about. So you don't find them as much in rocks. Um, but diamond is a mineral um, and not a rock. Um, let's see. How is radioactivity measured? Um, and how do you know how many parent and daughter isotopes are? Uh, so I will leave the the measuring of radioactivity to um, the physicists, the nuclear physicists. Um, but in general, you can measure radioactivity from a safety standpoint using a Geiger counter. Uh, so we used one of those in the lab at Rutgers to make sure that we weren't getting too much radiation. Um, but for the second part of that question of how do you know how many parent versus daughter isotopes they are, um, I mentioned that a little bit in the PowerPoint. So how we do that is uh, and with the mass spectrometer. So for instance, for uranium lead, the parent isotope is uh, 238 uranium and the daughter isotope, isotope is 206 lead. Um, in the mass spectrometer, we can move the detector or the magnet so that we can measure just uranium and just lead, but both at the same time. So to figure out how many or how much parent and daughter there is, we do that using mass spectrometry. Um, and then we can use those values in our mathematical equations uh, to calculate an age. Um, can this method be used for sedimentary rocks? Uh, yes, actually. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, um, mostly because a sedimentary rock is naturally made up of lots of other types of rocks. So um, if you remember your three rock types, there's igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, and sedimentary rocks, where a sedimentary rock is made up of class or parts of lots of older rocks that have now been all put together in a single rock. Um, so to date that rock using the techniques we just talked about, um, you might date different minerals within that rock using radioactive um, isotopes, but you have to create a thing called an isochron, um, which when you combine all that data together, which should be all different ages because it's different, it's coming from lots of different types of rock to form the new sedimentary rock. Um, but using a technique called an isochron, we can deduce the actual age of that sedimentary rock. So it takes a couple more steps, um, but you can, you can do it um, as well. Um, how did you get into the underground mine and what was the coolest thing about it? Uh, so we actually just drove in. Um, the way they, and there's a lot of mines underground that have elevator shafts, um, but the ones that we went to, they're on an incline like this. Um, so what they do is they just drill tunnels at different parts of the incline. And the tunnels are so shallow that you don't need an elevator. You can just drive down, down in. Um, the one I was in, I was probably around two kilometers uh, below the Earth's surface. Um, and uh, the coolest thing about it, uh, I don't know if it's cool. Uh, if you're claustrophobic, it was not cool. Um, it was very dark and very tightly spaced. They only drill out what's needed. So um, most of the walls were only, you know, two people uh, wide. Um, and, but it just, I, I got a very good appreciation for, for the amount of work that the, the people who work in the mines have to, have to do on a daily basis. Um, so just the whole experience is very cool. Um, but again, if you don't like dark, damp places and are claustrophobic, um, might not be, be for you. Um, from the moment you take your samples, how long does it take to ship them, process them, and analyze the data? Uh, that's a great question, and it uh, there's not one answer to it. Uh, in my experience, uh, you know, the samples I showed you that I collected were in 2014. Um, to ship them back probably took a few weeks. Uh, to process them, probably, you know, we had a lot of samples, took about six months. Um, and then over the course of the next three years, I collected data on those samples. So my first age probably came back uh, within a year um, from getting the sample. And then my last age, I think I got, you know, two months before I defended my thesis. So like six months ago from today. So it's a very long process. Sometimes 
it just depends on how many ages you want to get. It can take a year. It can take four. Um, it, it's a pretty, uh, it's a long process. <clears throat> Um, a follow-up to the to the mine uh, question: uh, Where is the entrance to the underground mine? Um, so it's actually just a ramp drilled in the side of a mountain. So here's the slope of the mountain, or just the landscape. They drill a a tunnel um, at different levels of this hill, and those tunnels are big enough to fit a car in. Um, and then once you're in that tunnel, there's lots of smaller tunnels called adits. Um, which are the ones that are only three people wide. Um, and that's where the, the actual drilling and blasting and collecting of the ore deposit um, happens. <clears throat> uh, another question, where can we find zircon in the United States? Uh, you can find it just about anywhere. Um, to be honest, if you pick up a rock outside um, that's not metamorphic, um, even if it is metamorphic, you might find one, but if it's a sedimentary rock, or an igneous rock, there are likely zircons in it. Um, now, how many zircons are in it depends on the type of rock and its chemistry. So a granite rock is more felsic, it has more silica. Um, that's gonna have a lot more zircon than something like a gabbro, which is a, a mafic or darker type of rock, which has a lot of magnesium um, and less iron, less silica. So it depends on, on the rock type, but just about any rock has a chance of having having zircon, which is another reason why it's so widely used uh, for getting the ages. Um, Kushi wants to know, and I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to this question. What is the smallest mineral? <clears throat> um, I think almost any mineral can be just about, I don't think there would be a, a holder for the smallest mineral. So for instance, uh, minerals form at all different sizes. Um, I've seen, uh, for instance, garnet is a mineral, and I've seen garnets the size of a house, and I've also seen garnets in thin section that are maybe, uh, you know, 100 microns or less. Uh, so, you know, you go from something that's maybe the width of your fingernail to something that's the size of a house, um, but that can happen just about with, with any mineral. Um, so there's no specific mineral that gets, that gets really small, at least that I know of. Um, they can all sort of uh, range any size. It just depends on, on how they form. Bria's mom wants to know what kinds of animals other than lions did I see? Uh, that's, a, that's a fun question. Uh, on my actual hike, so discarding the, the national park, um, in my actual hiking and, and everything, I saw giraffes, uh, I saw a zebra, and even on one hike, uh, me and my my party were, were, I wouldn't say chased, but followed by baboons. Um, namely, they, they wanted our lunch, um, but with some bang of a sledgehammer on nearby rocks and trees, they eventually just watched from a distance for the majority of the day. Um, but yes, I, I, zebras and giraffes and baboons, they were all part of the, part of the field work. Um, I never saw a scorpion, although we were told that in some of the places we were staying, they had scorpions. <clears throat> Um, let's see, what is, uh, where have you traveled to study geology and what was your favorite place? Um, as you know, I've, uh, been to South Africa a few times now. Um, I still think it's one of my favorite places. Uh, I have a lot of friends there now. It's great food. The people are all, um, extremely nice. Um, I've been to, to Paris. I've been to the UK, um, See, I've been to Nova Scotia uh, most recently. I feel like I'm forgetting a bunch of international ones. And then just everywhere in the United States. So um, Washington, uh, Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, where the geology is, is amazing. Um, I've led some field courses out there. Um, so I, I've been a lot of places, and I, I think that's one of my favorite parts of geology is, is uh, you get to travel to these places um, fairly often and, and, and meet different cultures and, and make new friends. And, um, it's a pretty rewarding experience. Um, why did you decide to become a geologist? Uh, so interestingly enough, I was, when I first went to college at the University of New Hampshire, I was undeclared. Um, and I just started taking science classes. And I realized very quickly that I liked all science. So I liked math, I liked chemistry, I liked physics. 
uh, you know, I like computer science. Um, and I also like geology. Um, and I have found that uh, geology is like the most multidisciplinary science that there is. So to be a good geologist, at least uh, if you're studying the things I am, you have to be at least decent at chemistry, math, physics, um, and computer science, um, as well as being uh, knowledgeable in geology. So I think what I liked about it was just that you get to use so many, so many different things. Um, and if you find everything interesting, like I do, um, then it's really kind of the best, the best way to go. Um, a couple more questions. How can you destroy diamonds? Uh, the only thing that can destroy a diamond is other diamonds. Uh, di like a diamond is the hardest mineral. It's a hardness of 10 on the Mohs hardness scale. So to destroy it, you sort of need a, a little bit of a harder diamond. Or you need to heat it up enough uh, where, you can, where you can melt it. Um, but even that takes temperatures that we find only in the lower parts of the mantle. Um, and even then, it might not happen. So most of the diamonds that are erupted are from the lower parts of the mantle um, where they have already crystallized. Um, so it's very hard to destroy a diamond. It's, it's almost impossible. Um, what is the oldest rock you have dated? Um, the oldest rock I have dated on Earth uh, or from Earth would probably be the, the Bushfeld rocks, which are just over 2 billion years old. Um, but I also work on a lot of meteorite samples. Um, and we've dated some meteorites in the lab um, that come close to the age of the solar system. So they're, they're about 4.4 uh, billion years old. Um, so we, we can date some very old things um, in terms of meteorites. And these meteorites are found uh, in deserts. Um, and also there's a program called AMSET um, that goes to Antarctica um, every year to look for, for meteorite falls um, on the Antarctic ice. And that's where a lot of these also, also come from. <clears throat> uh, let's see, there was a couple more in the chat. Um, what other tools do you use? Um, so uh, some other tools that we use, I mentioned mass spectrometry. Uh, that's useful for, for figuring out the ages of rocks, but also just figuring out basic chemistry to answer other questions. Um, one instrument that I ran at Rutgers was a laser ablation system, um, and it's exactly what it sounds like. So you put your sample in the machine and you shoot it with a laser and it blows a big hole in your sample and then sends that dust from that hole to a mass spectrometer so you can answer questions. And one of the best parts about running that lab uh, was that I got to work on a number of different things. We measured everything from lunar samples to mammal teeth to mummy teeth uh, to my samples to forams, uh, deep sea corals, um, really whatever came through the door that day. So uh, it was a great opportunity to, to kind of study lots of different materials um, on Earth. Uh, there are other instruments like an electron microprobe, um, and then just in terms of actual tools themselves, we obviously, a geologist's best friend is a sledgehammer, um, and then rock saws and crushers, um, everything that goes into getting that bulk rock that we took into the, the individual zircon crystals that we, that we need to date minerals. <clears throat> um, another question in the chat, uh, do you know the age of diamonds? Um, I don't, uh, diamonds span a lot of Earth's geologic history. Um, to figure out the age of the diamond, you would need to date the rock that it erupted with. Um, so if a diamond erupted uh, with, a, with a lava or something, um, you could date the, the rock that it erupted in, and that would be the age of the eruption of the, of the diamond. There's some other techniques that I won't get into, but there are ways to try to estimate the age of the crystallization of the diamond, which would be much older and much deeper in, in Earth's history. Let's see if I missed anything. A question just came in saying, what is your favorite mineral? What is my favorite mineral? Um, 
There's so many. Uh, I don't know. I think uh, I think garnet is my favorite mineral. Uh, zircon would be a close second. Um, but garnet just has wonderful shapes. Um, and if you ever get a chance to Google the Barton Garnet Mine, um, which is in, in New York, upstate New York, you find garnets that are the size of houses. Um, and they're perfectly shaped. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, and garnet's useful too. So most people don't realize this. Uh, Rhea might have mentioned it in her, her lecture, but um, the abrasives that you have in, in sandpaper are actually tiny garnets. Um, this garnet's pretty hard, at least the garnet from the Barton Garnet Mine. So um, that mine was used to make abrasives. Um, so yeah, I would say garnet is my favorite mineral and uh, zircon and olivine probably come up second and third. Uh, what is the biggest mineral? I do not know what the biggest mineral is. I assume, uh, I can't even assume how big it is, but I will mention that one thing that makes minerals uh, grow really large, they're, they're called pegmatites, the rocks that they're in, um, is fluids. So if you have really hot fluids in the earth and they flow through the rocks, they can often make the minerals grow into things that are the size of houses. Um, so that's where you get these giant garnets, these giant geodes, and things like that. Um, you need you need fluids, but I'm not I'm not sure what the world's biggest uh, mineral un uncovered is. My birthstone is aquamarine, I believe. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I feel like I had one more. Thanks, Jake. Yeah. I just looked it up. Uh, the biggest mineral. There's a the largest. Crystal is a gypsum in Chihuahua caves. How big? So, um, pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think we are out of time. Yeah. Um, so, so thank you, everybody. These were fantastic questions for joining us today. And thank you, uh, Jake, Dr. Satara, for presenting on the age of geologic rocks uh, for us. Um, and be sure to tune in this Thursday to hear um, Dr. Birmingham, sorry, I can't speak. <laughs> She's gonna be talking about how the earth formed. Um, so we'll see you on, on Thursday. All right, thanks everybody for joining.